Okay, then, uh, well, it's a great, great pleasure to welcome um, Sarah Teichmann from the Welcome Sanger Institute. So maybe for our friends from the Center of Intelligent System who are not in really in life science, the Welcome Sanger Institute is, you know, the, probably maybe the world leading genomics research institute located in Cambridge, UK. So just a few words about Sarah. So Sarah did her PhD with Cyrus Shochia at the MRC, Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And then she was also then a Bide Memorial Fellow at the University College London with Janet Thornton. She rapidly then started her group at the MRC um, in 2001. In 2013, she moved to the Welcome Genome Campus in Hingston, Cambridge, where her group was joined between the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute and the Welcome. And since 2016, Sarah is the head of the cellular genetics at the Welcome um, Institute. So we in life science know Sarah's work very well. You know, she's an EMBO member, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Science, and her work has really been groundbreaking from the beginning and really recognized by a number of prizes, including the Lisa Prize by Society Coldworth Medal, Royal Society Crick Lecture, and EMBO Gold Medal. So in terms of research, uh, Sarah has a long-standing interest in trying to understand global principles of gene regulation and protein interactions with some application to immunology. And her lab tends to use state-of-the-art genomics approach, including multiple single-cell genomics, spatial genomics, but also in combination with machine learning methods to advance our knowledge of cells and tissues. So I think you know, her recent work really exemplifies the synergy between machine learning and data science, at least in biology, and how you know, connection between both are very important. So, uh, Sarah, we look forward to your to your uh, research presentation, and the, the the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's a tremendous pleasure to speak here uh, at the beginning of 2023, and uh, to tell you about our work on um, uh, sort of computational analysis approaches uh, for analyzing data from the Human Cell Atlas Project. Um, I hope you can see my screen and the laser pointer. And um, so as an introduction to the Human Cell Atlas Project, um, what really motivates the, the consortium is the question of how a single genome encodes a multitude of cell types and um, sort of uh, uh, encodes the information for our cells and tissues, basically in the human body. So although we have obviously the identical genome sequence in every single one of the 37 trillion cells in our body, you know, we have somewhere between hundreds and, and many thousands of cell types and cell states that make up the tissues in our body, whether they are organs like um, the airways, the gastrointestinal system, or whether they're distributed systems like the vasculature, or the immune system, and so on. So the idea of mapping the cells in the human body in a systematic way has a long history. And 20 years ago in his Nobel lecture, Sidney Brenner said, we need a program of making maps of cells and maps of how cells talk to each other. And he called this project the cell map project. And he said, for that project, we don't need a model organism. So in other words, the human body itself is the subject of investigation. And this will be one of the things to occupy us for the next few decades. Um, and, and so Sydney is obviously known for kind of projecting in advance a lot. He didn't know about single cell genomics and spatial genomics at that time. But of course, these technologies came along. And then in 2016, kind of I reached out to Aviv Regev when I, when I got this job as head of cellular genetics at Sanger, because I was an EBIN Sanger before and said, you know, shall we work together to seize this moment for doing this cell mapping project? And Aviv had been advocating for a project she was calling the Human Cell Atlas over at um, NHGRI and, um, and, and was immediately incredibly enthusiastic about uh, bringing together the international community to, to work together to create this comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of our cells. And now, of course, as, as um, as you may be aware, this has grown to be a really uh, global scientific community, and we're now over two and a half thousand members from over 80 countries in the world. And it's an open science initiative. Um, anybody who's interested in mapping the cells in the human body is welcome to join. You can look at humancellatlas.org slash join hyphen HCA, and it's a very easy sign up form. 
you know, to receive information about the newsletters, the meetings, the, the online Zoom seminars, and 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 so on, and um, and also information about how we're structured into working groups and biological networks and so on. And in in fact, I should emphasize that the the computational analytical techniques are at the heart of this project, and the analysis working group was actually. I think the first working group that was formed for the project, and of course, both of Eve and I kind of have, have the computational techniques very close to our heart. So, as I said, what what sort of um, gave this this project the momentum? Uh, uh, you know, although Sydney had, of course, articulated that vision of mapping the cells, but it was the ability of genomics to sequence the nucleic acid content of single cells, so that the the single cell genomics revolution, or sorry, resolution revolution. Um, which is sort of laid out schematically in this image where you you know you're, you have the ability to take a complex tissue sample like a piece of heart tissue which you know has has uh, um, of course cardiomyocytes in it but also many other cell types like um, um, uh, you know blood uh, uh, um, cardiac conduction system um, uh, immune cells and so on and so forth and use single cell genomics to sequence the, the cells or nuclei in suspension to define the RNA content of every single cell in an unbiased way. And it's, it's that really made this project possible together with spatial genomics technologies, which sort of went, came kind of, of, of followed hand in hand, if you like. And of course, there, there are a variety of different approaches for achieving this, including um, the, the highly multiplex um, microscopy methods, but also different approaches for sequencing tissue sections in two dimensions, which can, of course, be, be taken in a, in a serial sections to reconstruct the, the three-dimensional tissue landscape of a sample, uh, again, using genomics to, um, 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 to get the three-dimensional landscape by using computational methods and, and integrating what we know from single-cell genomics with spatial methods. So that's really the the technology drivers of the human cell atlas. And I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the computational methods later. So in my own research group, um, we started uh, mapping human, human tissue. So we work on single cell uh, technologies, focusing mostly on mouse immune cells, and then uh, switched to, to studying human as, as the going away from models to, 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 to us ourselves as the subjects of investigation, if you like. And what we started off with in my lab was the maternal fetal interface. In other words, the placenta and decidua. So the, 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 the placental side of the, the pregnant uterus. And, um, and this is something that I was really interested in from the immunology point of view, because it's a longstanding conundrum or mystery of how the maternal immune system tolerates the paternal antigens without rejection and makes that uh, a vascularized environment in the uterus to support the um, the, the fetal growth through provision of nutrients and oxygen. And, um, and this was really um, the first or one of the first complete maps of a human organ um, covering all the different tissue regions of the placenta and um, interpreting the single cell genomics data of all the different cell compartments within the, the spatial structure of the organ. Um, and and uh, basically revealed new NK cell types on the maternal side, new uh, trophoblast cell types on the uh, fetal side, and and kind of opened up uh, um, a window onto the zonated architecture of the the placenta and the uterus. Um, and then what we focused on is other aspects of the development of the fetal immune system. So that was more the fetal cells and the maternal immune system studying the fetal immune system and how our immune system is set up for life after birth from the point of view of the lymphoid tissues of the liver and bone marrow, which are the sites where our, of course, the, the blood is made after birth and the thymus where our T cells are, are made. And then also um, focusing on barrier tissues like the airways, the gut and the skin where our body faces the outside world and has immune challenges, again, kind of looking through the lens of the immune system. Um, but then also studying uh, uh, um, uh, mus muscular tissue, a heart and skeletal muscle, again, supported by the immune system and, and the distributed immune system across tissues, which was um, a, a collaborative effort. All of these are collaborative efforts with many other groups, and I'd particularly like to highlight Moss Hanif as a very close, longstanding 
collaborator for all the immune development work. And, and um, what we're doing here is this cell mapping at scale during development in human physiology and in disease. So in, in that was really just to sort of lay, set this, the scene for my talk. What I want to focus on in three sections is basically a sort of quick overview of computational tools that my group is using um, kind of on this human cells journey. And then a bit more depth on a cell typist and the, our sort of cell type uh, a logistic regression model encyclopedia, and then a focus on computational methods for defining tissue microenvironments and, and a drug target workflow using the heart as a specific example at the end. So the, the computational methods, you know, in, in, in many at many, many stages of the workflow are fundamental to cell atlasing. And um, some of the examples of tools that my work has, my, my group has contributed to are, are cell typists, which is this encyclopedia of, of cell type models um, that I'll come on to. We've worked with Omar Bayraktor and, and Oli Stegler's groups on cell to location as an integrated workflow for um, resolving tissue architecture using spatial transcriptomics data and um, a single cell, single nuclear suspension genomics data in a probabilistic framework. Um, cell phone DB, which is sort of the cell-cell communication predictions using receptor ligands, so protein complexes that are signaling from one cell to the other cell and inferring um, the molecular uh, complexes involved in that communication from single cell and spatial data. And then drug to cell, which I'll come on to at the, the end of the talk. Um, which is a workflow for sucking in Kemble or drug bank data and mapping it uh, against single cell data to understand um, the cells that are targeted by drugs in, in either on-target uh, um, therapeutic mechanisms or on-target side effects. So cell typists, which is uh, I'll, I'll spend a bit more time on, are um, our collection of machine learning models, logistic regression models for cell types. And um, the, the idea here, and this is something that we've used as a tool kind of from, from the very beginning, is that you have a, a, um, a, just a linear model, basically, of the weighted combination of, of expression signatures in, in single cell, single nuclear transcriptomics. And you can then use that as a tool to search against any single cell uh, or, or sort of even bulk um, expression data set and, and um, predict the cell types that are there and annotate your cell types. And we started off in a, in a big sort of systematic way doing this for immune, the human immune cells that we published in, in May this year. And, and the sort of long-term vision is to have a single model collection that encompasses all cell types. At the moment in cell types, you can get like multiple model collections. And um, going hand in hand with the models, we also have a cell type a, a kind of database or an encyclopedia with a little description of the cells, um, uh, basically a, an, a curated ontology of the names using the EBI cell ontology database, and then also markers that come out of the, the logistic regression models uh, that are, that are um, inferred from the, the collections of data. Um, the, the second me method that I mentioned was, uh, was, was cell to location. And um, uh, this is a kind of an ongoing tool that's that's developed uh, by Vitaly Klevchevnikov and collaborators in Omar Baraktor's group and also with Oliver Stegler. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, thought, I thought I had an animation, but I think this is just basically to, to encourage you to have a look and use this if you're interested, because it's a, a whole workflow that includes not just the probabilistic framework for integrating single cell and deconvoluting spatial transcriptomics, the, the voxels, that you get from your um, imaging or uh, bead or voxel-based spatial transcriptomics, but it also goes beyond that now with having a very cool uh, non-negative matrix factorization approach for extracting um, sort of communities of cells that are repeatedly co-located in a data set or across multiple data sets. And, and it's on um, GitHub and, and documented there and is kind of... Um, ongoing develop. Oh, the, the animation is working now. So here we go. This is kind of example uh, where you have your single cell suspension data and you want to map it onto a coarse grain spatial transcriptomics data set. So the example is the mouse brain and here are sort of hippocampal neurons and inhibitory neurons. And they're now being mapped onto their locations in the tissue section through the mouse brain. Um, 
you can also integrate, for instance, uh, uh, working from spleen mapping onto a lymph node. So if you have your cell types defined in one data set, you can try to approximate the other tissue. That's what's happening here in the human data exemplified. So this is kind of an example showing you how you know these methods are really uh, uh, at the heart of the human cells project. It's sort of part and parcel of the, the suite of techniques. So yes, it's single cell genomics and spatial technologies are driving the human cells. Um, and the analysis techniques are um, uh, sort of incredibly important in helping us make sense of, of, of the data and interpret it and understand what, what are the cells in our body and um, how are they organized in tissue microenvironments. And so on that you know, topic of tissue microenvironments, in that original placenta paper many years ago now, um, what we, we uh, took was the... the uh, receptor ligand complexes, which are the the protein-protein interactions that are responsible for um, communication across cells, kind of exemplified here in this little schematic, and we're taking them, of course, from um, from known uh, databases, uh, for, from databases that describe known complexes, including the protein data bank of of three D complexes, but also other protein interaction databases. And um, with awareness of subunit stoichiometry, so that if there's multiple subunits that are needed for, for the ligand or the receptor, um, the, the uh, computational framework is aware of that. And um, this was, was first developed by Rosa Ventotormo back in the day when she was a postdoc in the group, and she's now really taken over the further maintenance and development, you know, in, in, still in collaboration with me. But uh, she's really driven this also together with Mirana Efremova, who's now a group leader at um, Queen Mary in London. Um, and, and of course, this, this basically, um, we've now extended this to also soluble small molecules um, and, and also to a spatial transcriptomics framework. And it's all kind of available on, on, on the um, cell phone DB website, but also on GitHub. And, and um, finally, I want to uh, mention drug to cell, which I'll again come back to at the end, which is basically our drug target exploration um, where we, um, you know, we're using the publicly available database of drug target pairs, which is 20 million drug target pairs in Kemble, um, and then filter by sort of bioactivity metrics, the different drug categories, the clinical trial phase, um, the molecule class, and so on, and then integrate that with human cellless data, you know, from across the body to find um, basically uh, detailed predictions about how a drug could be acting because of course it's not always uh, known precisely you know which cell types that, that were previously you know unknown for instance and are now being described at high resolution by human cellless data which cell types are mediating the mechanism of action of a drug and um, um, is this drug acting across one or multiple cell types in the human body and a lot of kind of new um, insights for 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 mechanisms of action and for side effects are, are now coming through um, this this pipeline um, that a very talented Japanese postdoc uh, Kazumasa Kanemaru, together with an incredibly talented clinician scientist PhD student James Cranley, who is trained as a cardiologist, have been developing in my group and and this is unpublished uh, uh, and in preparation we'll release it in GitHub and and BioArchive very soon. And so the idea is here that we can um, we can sort of assay compounds in a, in a computational framework and also predict kind of safety in um, human cellulose data from males, from females, from pregnancy, and so on and so forth. So what would be the mechanism of action um, from a um, computational predictive pipeline, use it on healthy tissue, disease tissue, and so on. So that's a kind of overview of a rough overview of some of the kind of looking back now of some of the, the key sort of computational tools that my group has contributed to in the in the recent years for uh, analyzing human cell atlas data. And um, I want to spend a little bit more time on cell typist and then move on to um, a sort of worked example of unpublished data where we're focusing on the cardiac conduction system, so the, the heart, basically. Um, so what, um, what really kind of spurred us on to develop cell typists in a systematic way was our study of the, the, the adult immune system. And um, what we're asking here is 
what are the different immune cell states um, as they're uh, not, not, not just in the blood, but as they're adapting and contributing to the tissues in, in, inside the, the organs in our body. And, and so, as I'm sure you know, the um, uh, blood cells are basically made in, in adults, mostly in the bone marrow and fetal stages of human development in the liver. T cells are made in the thymus. Um, they then migrate out through the blood into the lymph nodes and spleen. Um, but many also contribute to either back from, from pregnancy or also from the blood in, in adult life, contribute to the tissues themselves. So they migrate out of the blood vessels and sit inside our tissues, our heart, our liver, our kidney, and so on. And uh, the question that we're asking here is, what are the features of those immune cells that are sitting inside the tissues? And, and um, what are their kind of like specific shades of flavors or personalities uh, if we have the same cell type, the T cell, the B cell, the monocyte, and so on sitting in different tissues? So that's really what motivated this study. And um, uh, the other thing to mention about this is that in the Human Cellist Project, we're now at a stage where we are, we are kind of what I view as the assembly phase, if you like. So we already have quite sort of significant draft data for, for many different organs. Um, and so we can start to basically integrate that data to ask this kind of question. And so this project, so making the cell type models, the initial stages of the project actually came from about 20 published data sets from different organs in the body. We then supplemented with Tabula sapiens, which was published in the same issue of science as cell typist, and um, and then kind of supplemented with our own in-depth uh, experimental data sets. But the the um, sort of initial drivers was basically computational integration of published data sets from around the body, and um, we took these twenty published data sets that covered uh, roughly the same number of tissues or so, curated the labels, and so that we could then um, sort of link up the data sets kind of in a, 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 a semi-automatic sort of workflow and, um, and, and train logistic regression models so that we could then um, build on those an automatic annotations for our own um, fresh data set that came from 12 disease transplant donors, um, uh, both lymphoid which means kind of making the, the blood and immune cells. So the lymphoid tissues are shown on the left, lymph node, blood, bone marrow, et cetera, and then non-lymphoid tissues like airways, gut, and so on. And we had about 330,000 cells that we then uh, uh, automatically annotated with those models. And, and we then, of course, went back and uh, refined those models and retrained the, um, the, the cell type is collection um, to, to arrive at a final annotation. And um, uh, the, the kind of concept here is that we're going um, from, from a smaller data set where we're putting in a lot of knowledge. So I said that the, the alignment across those 20 public data sets was through label curation because the, um, you know, every paper kind of calls the cells slightly different names. So it's hard to kind of uh, connect them using using the words and it's equally hard to connect them and integrate them computationally and so uh, initially when we were starting from those limited data sets we're using a lot of knowledge to make the the logistic regression models but then as we're kind of getting to more and more data now um, basically we're sort of going into an era and this is a, a from Carl Henrik Eck who's a Gaussian process kind of expert in the computer science department in Cambridge using, this is a kind of general concept that he's trying to put forward where he's saying that as you get to more and more data, you can, you, you need to add less and less knowledge yourself. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in the, the human cell atlas kind of era is as we, um, at the beginning, in order to advance, we need to put in a lot of biological expert knowledge, you know, to to integrate the data, to train the models and so on. But as we can then iterate, we've got larger and larger volumes of data coming through and the, the training of the models basically becomes much easier and automated and we need to put less kind of expert knowledge in and that's where we're kind of getting towards now. Um, and, and of course, there are different approaches for model training. Um, 
and you know they have pros and cons they're linear versus non-linear approaches and and at the moment cell type is using this logistic regression approach we compare to a bunch of other methods that have in terms of um perceived performance but it doesn't basically doesn't have to stay we don't have to stick to 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 that sort of framework for model training we you know the but we may we may um move to other methods in the future the the benefit here is that um you 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 can run a subset of models if you're only interested in the immune system, for instance, you don't have to run all the epithelial and, and fibroblast models. You can run it at one at a time. If you're interested in a specific T helper cell subset, you can only run that. So it's not, it's, uh, it has certain benefits over, for instance, the um, uh, variational autoencoder kind of deep learning frameworks for aligning data sets in the sense that it's, it allows you to segment different subsets more. But, the, you know, all these different methods for automated annotation. Um, have their applications and, and their pros and cons. So what what uh, Chuan Shu, who is the postdoc, who sort of drove this forwards uh, um, and is still working on this now to, to develop the collection more, is um, various optimizations to um, to make the framework scalable and 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 basically in memory and also in in uh, compute time. And we we make all the models available on celltypist.org and um, and also the um, the sort of cell calling card encyclopedia type element of it, as I've mentioned. And in terms of the um, the biological insights in this paper that was in the Human Cell Atlas bundle in Science in May, where we had four different papers that were sort of released at the same time. There was the Tabula Sapiens um, a, a suspension cell, single nuclear analysis of, of GTEx tissue, frozen tissue, and um, uh, this paper focusing on the immune system, and another paper from us focusing on development of immunity. Um, what the, the the basically the key kind of insights were, you can see here the different um, mononuclear phagocytes, B cell states, T cell states, unconventional T cell subtypes, mate cells, INK T cells, and so on, and then the um, so the definition of some of these cells kind of gave a sharper understanding of of the the cell types uh, in our our human immune system, and then the um, the localization and distribution of uh, in in the different tissues. You see here bone marrow spleen, lung draining lymph node, mesenteric lymph node, which is gut draining liver, lung jejunum, kind of small intestine, and so on. Is that the distribution of the different compartments? And some of these are completely expected. You expect to see progenitors uh, in the bone marrow, you expect to see memory cells in the spleen and so on, but some of them gave really um, uh, deeper insights, for instance, into tissue resident T-cell states in the gut and, um, and also clonal sharing uh, across different tissues. So here, um, what, I, what I'm um, just putting on your radar is that for lymphocytes like T and B cells, we have the transcriptome or the, the spatial genomics data and so on, which gives us information about the cell and its location. But what we also have encoded in the antigen receptor, so the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor, is the clonal relationship between the cells. In other words, which cells come from the same progenitor? So which cells are brothers or sisters or cousins, basically, and have come from the same, the same uh, activated naive T or B cell? And so we, we use that information to track which cells have have interconverted between each other or um, developed from the same progenitor and can can, for instance, link different T effector memory states that switch between um, having tissue residency receptor profiles as they are going from a lymphoid tissue to a non-lymphoid tissue, for instance, or from the um, uh, from the lymph node to the tissue. and and these are these are the different um, uh, sort of killer T cell states here that are, tissue resident memory cells that you can see as examples. Um, and so that that's kind of telling us not only about cell state, but also the lineage and development of the cell as it migrates around the body. So just to summarize this cross tissue uh, analysis and cell type is we integrated published data on the immune system, made a cell type encyclopedia and a model collection, 
and then used it to, to get towards an integrated human cellulose uh, picture of the immune system in the first instance. But you could imagine this for other lineages as well, um, uh, such as the vasculature, the muscul musculoskeletal system, um, the, 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 the autonomic nervous system, and so on and so forth. And, and just to sort of acknowledge the, the um, collaborators on this, um, this was driven by a pair of incredibly talented postdocs, Cecilia Dominguez Conde, who now has her own group at the Human Technopole in Milan, and Chuan Shu, whom I've mentioned as the main cell typist developer, and then other members of the group, including Thomas Gomez, who is actually a postdoc in, in Switzerland and Barbara Treutlein's group now, and um, uh, collaborators, fantastic collaborators in the clinical school in Cambridge, Joe Jones, Cora Saib Parsi in Manic Clatworthy, Louisa James in London, and then collaborators in the US near Yosef at Berkeley and Peter Sims and Donna Farber in New York City. And um, in the last part of my talk, what I wanna move on to is some unpublished work now, um, uh, tell you about uh, um, computational analysis techniques that came out of our focus on our continued focus on the heart. And um, in particular, what we are asking here is how cells fit into the tissue microenvironment by integrating single cell expression and multiomics data with spatial transcriptomics data. And from a biology point of view, um, what we want to uh, learn here is um, a more in-depth understanding of the heart as this major pump inside our body that's delivering oxygen to the lung, the brain, and the rest of the body. And um, of course, we've had previous uh, previous paper basically describing the muscular free walls of the four chambers of the heart, the two atria and the two ventricles. But it, the, the, the heart is actually a really complex organ that has uh, valves. It's got its own kind of nervous system, which is the cardiac conduction system that coordinates the beating rate um, and the, the, the coordinated numbers. And, and so in order to understand this in more detail, uh, and we wanted to map or discover the spatial microenvironments of uh, the cardiac conduction system, of this, this nervous system of the heart. And um, the, there, I've described cell to location in a little bit before, and I've mentioned that we can um, basically map cell types to their their using Visium, which is the 50 micron resolution 10 astronomic spatial transcriptomics slides here, we can basically define 50 micron little expression voxels in a, um, um, in a, a, a half centimeter squared slide and, um, and then use cell to location to, to sort of to map the, the cell states to those voxels but then also use non-negative matrix factorization to define kind of communities of cells that are recurring. Um, so that's one kind of workflow for unbiased analysis, uh, which is this. But the other, the other approach, and of course, for each of these spatial transcriptomics slides, you've also got um, the, the uh, bright field microscopy um, HNE image, which is basically the conventional dye staining of the tissue section. And that's what you can sort of see here and here. And working together for in, in the context of the heart with an expert cardiologist, pathologist at Imperial College, Professor Yen Ho, um, she was able to define the different uh, regions of the heart based just based on that morphological data from the H&E stain, defining what she thought was the optimal um, kind of expert definition of endocardium, which is the inside of the heart, the epicardium, the outside fat, fibrotic regions, myocardium, nerve, node, vessel, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what we did then was to use her annotations and do a, an enrichment analysis, looking at which cells were enriched in those expert annotated regions. We then took the automated uh, workflow from, from cell to location, scored them against each other, and then kind of harmonized the, uh, uh, the manual annotation with the unbiased um, uh, a factorization analysis to get uh, to get at a kind of optimal definition of the microenvironments. And what this revealed was that there are two different regions of the sinoatrial node. And, and um, what I should emphasize is that this node region is the region that contains pacemaker cells. Um, and that's known kind of from studies across the heart of different mammals. 
and there's a very special cell type that sits in the um, uh, sort of in the in in the right atrium, basically where um, uh, there are cells that beat spontaneously, and these are amongst the only cell types in our body that have a spontaneous firing pattern. They're called pacemaker cells. Um, and they, they are the cells that define the rate at which our heart beats. And they sit in this, it's known that they sit in this nodal region and that's what she's annotated. Um, but what we were able to define using this integrated computational analysis of the, the spatial transcriptomics and the, the single cell genomics is that, that that region actually subdivides into two, di two different regions, the, the peripheral node and the central node. And the pacemaker cells here, which are P cell, um, sit in the in the central node, which probably won't surprise you. And there are fibroblasts and macrophages that co-localize with them. And then the peripheral node has other fibroblast glial and, and adipocyte populations that kind of insulate, we think. We interpret it as sort of insulating those pacemaker cells that are sending out the electric signals and, and firing spontaneously. And so in a way, this sort of new... Uh, cell atlas technologies and computational workflows are kind of um, um, revealing a level of detail that the the microscope and the conventional methods, you know, can't can't see. So it's kind of opening up uh, a, a more detailed, higher resolution understanding of the cells and the tissue microenvironments that they're located in definition of the, the microenvironments. And so I've described this for for just now for the nodal region where the pacemaker cells are sitting, but the same kind of logic applies to niches in the epicardium, which is the uh, 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 region that's the outside of the heart uh, of the four chambers. And what we discovered there was an immune niche um, where we have plasma B cells sitting with macrophages and fibroblasts maintaining what we think is a kind of immune reservoir that's sort of protecting our heart from the dirty lung that's right next door and, and um, kind of insulating it in an immunological sense. And then also fibrotic areas um, that Yen has, has annotated where we see enrichments of a particular activated fibroblasts that are depositing these fibrotic um, um, deposits of collagen that are talking to macrophages and uh, vascular endothelial cells and parasites from, from small vessels through TGF beta OSM and, and BMP signaling. And so um, basically I should emphasize that these are healthy hearts, but even in, a, in, an, in, a, in, a, in an elderly adult, you'll see these microfibrotic micropathological areas. And this is what we are uh, defining as fibrotic regions here. So it's just part of the, the aging process basically, but even that sort of healthy heart gives us insight into mechanisms of fibrosis that are going on during aging. So this is again showing you um, an image of a beating heart. The nodal region is, is shown this little uh, red um, uh, firing here. And of course, that's the region that contains the, the pacemaker cells in over here in the sinoatrial node. And then there's a matched node in, in the, uh, the atrial ventricular node on the other side. And this is linked to the cardiac conduction system, which, which uh, consists of Purkinje bundles and fibers that then extend out into the um, uh, all the different muscular regions and coordinate that beating pattern that you see um, that's, that's uh, across the, the two atria and, and, and two ventricles. And so computationally, the way that we define those uh, pacemaker cells is through the channel expression pattern. Um, so they are the, these, there's initially, we now have more tissue and more cells and more data, but this is kind of early data where we just had two, two donors. I mean, during the pandemic, it was really hard doing this project. Uh, very few donors were, were coming in from the transplant surgeons and um, there, there were, we only had two hearts and we saw these small population of pacemaker cells that is dis distinct from the rest of the working cardiomyocytes through this very high expression of a calcium channel, CACMA one d uh, whereas you can see that in the other working cardiomyocytes, there's this sodium channel SCN5A that's highly expressed. And the pacemaker cells that have that particular channel that's known from murine studies uh, also have, you can see, you can see they have a very characteristic pattern of GPCRs and channels and transporters here that's different from atrial cardiomyocytes and ventricular cardiomyocytes and, and uh, glial cells. So they, they have this very... Um, characteristic distinct pattern that 
gives us the clue that they're different from other cardiomyocytes and, and sort of confidence from uh, sort of conventional molecular studies that some of the markers are there. And we can then define, of course, the full kind of expression pattern. And what James wanted to do then was to figure out which drugs are, are being targeted to the pacemaker cells and have a chronotropic effect. And what that means is an effect on the rate of the beating of our heart. And so I said, go to our neighbors at EBI, get the get the Kemble database, download it, and then match it against our data. And um, we can then see which chronotropic drugs that are, have the, the WHO code for cardiovascular system are targeting the pacemaker cells. And you can see here, um, Evapridine, uh, uh, et cetera, are targeting pacemaker cells as expected. But what also happened was that there are unexpected drugs like uh, diabetes drugs, such as liraglutide, um, um, uh, semaglutide, and so on, that are that are also targeting the pacemaker cells. And this is really unexpected because they are cardiovascular, or they are um, metabolic drugs, right, that are affecting diabetes and, and glucose metabolism. And yet they are they seem to be hitting pacemaker cells. And the reason for that is that we find in this human data that uh, human pacemaker cells exp express GLP-1 receptor and GREA-3, which are um, receptors for GLP-1, which of course is when it's, it's processed, it's involved in, um, in insulin signaling and, and glucose metabolism. And yet uh, this, these drugs are hitting the pacemaker cells. And in the side effects, it's been reported that they have these drugs have a six beats per minute roughly chronotropic effect on patients on diabetes patients, and but what wasn't understood was whether that effect is coming through the autonomic nervous system and having an effect on central you know brainstem or or uh, spinal cord or it's having a direct effect on the heart. And what our data suggests is that the mechanism of this side effect could be through a direct action on the pacemaker cells. So that really brings me to, to, to just summarize that I've talked to you about um, uh, in, in this project in, of the heart defining cell type composition, basically, what are the cells that we have there, discovering tissue microenvironments, basically how are cells working together to make uh, this peripheral and centric nodal region, the epicardial niche, the fibrotic niches, and, and how can we then go on to understand how drugs are acting through the human cell atlas data. And I've mentioned uh, Kazumasa Kanemaru, who's a Japanese uh, clinician scientist postdoc, and James Cranley, who's a welcome clinical PhD student in the group, uh, Carlos and Mona, who, who, who worked on the heart before and who sort of set this, the foundations for this work, and other members of the group, our wet lab support team, um, our tissue processing team, our, our valued and important collaborators at Imperial College London, Michaela Noseda's group with her group members, um, the, the Cambridge Biorepository for Translational Medicine for heart uh, biopsies and the donors and their families, uh, which we, we, we mustn't forget are kind of um, important to make this work possible, and then other collaborators and funders that I'd like to acknowledge. So the overall, um, what I hope I've given you a flavor of is the AML and other computational tools that are revolutionizing human biology and propelling the insights of the human cell atlas and that we have a really exciting um, uh, synergy between the wet and the dry science. And um, just to say thank you for your attention, I'll be delighted to take questions. Thank you very much. We now have time for some questions. We have Professor Bitpol with us. We'll, uh... Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this amazing talk, and thank you, Jan, for um, the introduction. So, um, yeah, I, I, it would be nice now to um, hear from the audience. So you can either type your question in the chat or raise your hand and speak up, and maybe the second option is very good. So let me see if there are some already raised hands in the list of participants. Um, I mean, if not, I can maybe start with uh, with one question to begin this. Um, so um, I was very interested to hear that the uh, logistic regression approach uh, works so well to the, for this uh, classification of, of cells. And I was wondering, like, are there cases where other methods could uh, bring more insight or is it uh, 
kind of a general feature that this one is very good. No, I think, uh, no, I think it's, it's a sort of context specific uh, for sure. And, um, um, you know, and I'd, I'd be happy to discuss this. I mean, the ones that we've tested, uh, you know, are the ones that I show the Fisher kernel, this, um, um, SVMs, you know, support vector machines and so on. Um, and, but they are tested on data sets, you know, of a certain size kind of in that area, in, in that era of data, uh, of the human cell atlas and more complex, uh, definitely I could see other methods kind of helping, um, and, and, and sort of overtaking. Um, yeah. So, so what, what kind of, uh, of methods specifically can help in those cases? I mean, what we've also used for, you know, for modeling entire data sets, entire objects, for instance, in that paper, um, I showed very quickly where we integrate development data. So we published two papers in science back to back, the cell type is, which was for the adult data, and then an integration of uh, human developmental data across many tissues and, and gestational time points. And that was about 1 million cells, so a much bigger data set. And what we used for that was the SC arches um you know deep learning framework for label transfer across the the entire one million fetal cells to you know three quarters of a million adult cell cells and so that was basically a, a you know a different approach it's very convenient very fast it compares two data objects but what it what it doesn't have is let's say if you want to focus on only searching for monocytes in a data set because what I then just the logistic regression model very very quickly search it against you know can be millions of cells quickly get the the scores for that so I think there are also benefits for different tasks like different methods can uh, be better at different tasks Sure, that's great. Thanks a lot. Um, so, okay, so I, I uh, would advise that people with questions uh, can just pick up now. So please go ahead. Uh, and of course, you can raise your hand in case there is a, a line of questions. Any question from the audience? Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, Jan, do you have a question? Yeah, I would have one. I I found this very intriguing what you showed for the diabetes drug, the effect on the on the receptor on the pacemaker cells. Mm -hmm. Was this a known uh, side effect that this drug actually increases the heart rate? Yeah. Is that... Okay. So you could validate well, something I mean, which I has. I think it's quite controversial still, but the clinicians have reported it. So so it has been reported by cardiologists and 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 and, and um, uh, endocrinologists. Yeah. But the receptor was not known. The receptor interaction was not known. No, so the target. receptor interaction is known that it's, okay. that it's one receptor. What's what's what wasn't known was that that receptor is expressed in pacemaker cells. Oh, super interesting. But it's yeah. obviously ex expressed in um, uh, pancreas or liver, or like what you know, uh, which is where it's acting. Um, but it's not. It, it wasn't expected in in the in 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 the cardiac tissue. So that's the, that's the, the the key thing, and so there was like some you know su suspicion that it could you know wasn't really known is it acting through the heart or is it acting through the autonomic nervous system or right. yeah. Do you do you think this or is, it not, or is this like a not actually a side effect that's real you know that's also debated, and I guess right. what this data suggests is that you know the side effect is real and this is the potential mechanism for how it's being mediated. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe another question to to follow up to the the first one I asked. So, if you want to discover subtypes, for instance, in the immune system, um, some some types of, of of immune cells, do you need to somehow refine the method, or is a method that is trained in order to discover broad cell types, or also working on these kind of subtypes? Mm. So, 
the I mean, I guess what the um, what the uh, a model collection of of cell types can if you if you know if you sort if you run it against a new data set, what it can point towards is cell data points that aren't matching any of the existing models well. And then that suggests that this is, you know, a new, I'll say, well, data type, uh, data point, a new cell state that's not described by the existing model collection. Um, so in that sense, it can be helpful. And of course, you get a score, logistic regression, like how well is it matching, and 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 then if, so if have, like especially if there's a whole group of cells that are outliers and, yes. and that aren't matched well, or, then then that points you towards a new cell state. So you would you would need to define a new label in that case and exactly i mean then the logical thing is to basically recluster and then retrain and then define a shared signature a shared expression signature in that group and then you know it experimentally validate for instance or whatever whether that's a, a new yeah, that, that's very cool thanks a lot yeah um and in the the case where you incorporate also the spatial environment mm. um in the end, can you assess like how much of the of the learning is coming from the uh, space spatial information, how much is coming from the transcription transcription info information? Um, so that's a great question, and basically, I think the um, you know at the moment the like the models don't explicitly kind of take spatial uh, localization into account. Um, and so the way we, you know, the way we defined like the, the spatial adaptation was just through um, differential gene expression or let's say Milo analysis, you know, KNN neighborhood distinction. I don't know, we, we published this paper with, Emma Dan and John Marioni in Nature Biotech uh, mm -hmm. last year or the year before, we're using KNN neighborhood that's shifting, you know, between one look, one um, data group and another data group, and so on. Um, but I think in in future, like it would be great to see more models that are explicitly taking into account um, the tissue, microenvironment, and so on, and then. Um, modeling the the cell state kind of in 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 a I don't know Bayesian or in like an integrated way as a single as a single framework if you like at the moment I don't know any method that sort of does that in one elegant model. Oh, I see. Cool. Thanks. And in the KNN case, uh, is there a principled way to choose K, for instance, or is it more like you optimize over it? Yeah, you optimize over several. Um, several uh, K sizes, yeah. True, that makes sense. Thanks a lot. Uh, do we have uh, other questions from, from the audience? Please don't hesitate to, to speak up. Uh, I know Last that it's sometimes a bit, uh, you know, intimidating, but don't hesitate to speak up. Are you saying I'm intimidating? No, I, I'm saying Zoom is intimidating. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if it sounded uh, that the other way. Uh, I'm just saying that the you know questions uh, virtually is a little bit you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it can be a bit artificial. And, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, okay, I mean, if we don't have any more questions, maybe we should uh, thank Tara again for this great talk. It was really exciting, and uh, thank you very much again. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Time. Yeah, maybe nice just some words of closing, if I may. Yeah, sure, of course. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Leichmann, for having been with us. Thanks to all of you. This was our very first CES colloquium in 2023. Many more uh, talks, hybrid and online events are lined up. We can just encourage you to please uh, go to our website, cs.dpfl.ch, or subscribe to our newsletter. Stay tuned, and we are looking forward to seeing you all soon again, either online, on-site, or in one of our hybrid events. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Applause.